Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Tolo Oluwumi, who has worked in as a social entrepreneur. She was trained as a chemical engineer and uh, evolved into a political strategist. And I, that makes me grin because I was trained as an electrical engineer who evolved into what I'll call a political economist. Uh, she's worked in many areas with the United Nations, the International Office of Migration. I think she, you're still on the board, I believe, of the USA Office uh, for IOM, which is now working with the United Nations. She was once named in uh, 2015, one of the 15 women changing the world and an outstanding woman entrepreneur by the World Economic Forum. Uh, you're a vibrant public speaker. I've seen you speak many times. You're, you're just woven in between business, government, civil society, and uh, originally from Nigeria, came to the United States, has been very involved in the questions of immigration, climate change, and African economic development. Tolu, thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just, uh, you know, how would I put it? A pandemic like this is chaotic and disconcerting and disorienting for many, many, for all of us, really. It's not, this isn't a movie we've seen before. And yet I see you with such breadth and awareness of things around the world and with a kind of radiant, optimistic tone whenever you're in a public forum. So if some if you said hum, we got to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, there's nobody I'd rather talk with than you. <laughs> but but things are grim right now. They're grim in the global South. There's a really really toxic politics in the United States and and an inward look that is not helpful. How how do you see what's happening? What haunts you? What inspires you? What are examples that you think we should all be paying attention to? Wow, there's, there's a, a lot of uh, a lot of deep thinking questions. What haunts me? Oh, yeah, a lot of things. Uh, you know, we're living in a rapidly changing time where the world and its structures are being uniquely challenged. Uh, there is massive disruption, high uncertainty, and the corona crisis has upended life for billions around the globe. I think what is at top of mind for me is really people, right? How are people surviving day to day? Um, how are people adjusting? And how will we come out at the other end of this? Um, I am originally from, from Nigeria, I was born, born in Nigeria, and Africa holds a very special place in my heart. Um, and I am frightened sometimes because there is such already such massive inequalities that exist and healthcare systems that are not set up um, some on the best day to handle an average crisis, let alone this one uh, that is upend in systems in, in the West and around the globe. I am frightened and nervous about civil unrest, um, possible regime change, uh, in, in different places that might not be able to handle it. Those, those I think for me are, are really the things that keep me up at night, thinking through how to not have a continent that in some ways is still playing catch up, fall further behind, um, how to make sure that the gains that are being made on the United Nations Sust uh, Sustainable Development Goals continue to, to achieve its targets. Um, and there isn't uh, a receding to old ways. There isn't a pulling back from progress um, because of fear of the repercussions of uh, you know, investing financially in those beyond your immediate sphere, sphere of influence. I think that's what I would say is haunting me. Is, is that haunting enough? <laughs> Well, I, uh, I remember uh, you shared an article with me and uh, 
gentleman who's, uh, I believe, associated with the World Health Organization, David Navarro, uh, said that the poorer nations really don't have the resources to effectively battle the coronavirus and that they uh, are on the edge of losing faith in governance. I know from my own experience working with the Mo Ibrahim Foundation and others that in Africa, on the continent, you have a relatively young population base. I think the average age on the continent is in the neighborhood of 28 years old, and the average age of governance, meaning people in government, is in their 60s. In the United States, the average age is, say, 37, 38, right in that window, and the average age of people in governance is 57, so it's narrower. But what was startling to me in Africa was that the young people's faith that governance was looking out for in building their future, uh, the people who would affirm that notion was about 8%. And now the pandemic, which you might call taxes the resources and taxes the capacity of leaders to lead. And uh, Mr. Nabarro, he spoke about this could lead to social unrest and a great deal of unnecessary turbulence and death. Uh, I, I, I don't, how would I say, want to dwell on the darkness, but I, that, I think those challenges are real. How, how do you perceive it? You know, the challenges are real. Um, they're absolutely real. Global health experts fear that the virus potential impact um, you know, the, the, on sub-Saharan Africa could be just devastating um, in, in, in many of these countries that have weaker health systems. Um, you know, we're wary of the devastation it could bring to uh, some of the governments uh, who haven't acted or quickly haven't acted as quickly um, in implementing travel bans or closing schools, banning large large gatherings, etc. Um, though we saw that you know Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, they definitely did that, but others lagged behind. Uh, so th there is uh, there is quite a bit of nervousness. Uh, there is also a need for there to be trust. Right. Uh, you you mentioned uh, as you spoke about there being just a very low level of trust um, in, in, in citizens believing that governments are looking out for them. But to be able to effectively navigate this crisis, there has to be trust. Uh, citizens must trust that they are being guided by their governments, being guided by facts and science and are acting in the best interest of society. Uh, citizens have to retain their faith in their leaders um, and their ability to, to lead. So that is a, a really incredible tipping point uh, where if we don't have that as a basis, if I as a citizen am not convinced that what I'm being told to do is not in my best interest and will not save me and my family, that there is an imbalance there and that could be significantly problematic. Um, and of course that translates to not just the social distancing that helps with this, but also um, the testing and contact tracing. There is a lot of trust that has to go uh, between governments and citizens and other for the, the people to willingly give up their health information um, to be tracked, to be tested, uh, so that there is a method to the madness. There is a way to address this in a scientific and a systematic way. Well, I, I sense that the key word here, trust, that you brought up, is something that's very, very hard to achieve. In my own country, and, and now your country, with congratulations on your receiving your green card. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, the government that we have leading the country now had a campaign in 2016. The essence of was, the system is rigged. And there may be some truth in that. But the denigration of expertise and the collapse of faith and trust in expertise or in the integrity of expertise, even in the United States, is, is now a tremendous impediment. 
to which you might call first calm nerves and secondly uh, taking direction when people in Michigan where I come from are holding rallies against being confined when the quarantine of people and their movement is a public good that stops the propagation and the magnitude and duration of this of the horrid effects of this pandemic we have real problems and 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 i'm not an expert on africa but my i sense in africa and other parts of the global south the the trust in governance is is no greater or perhaps even more dire than in the united states you've been you know uh go ahead please no no no, please no i say you've been in your own life faced with lots of challenges and in i mentioned moments ago uh, your immigration status was a, a quite uh stressful thing and it inspired you as as you often do to form political organization uh, to alleviate that kind of distress for other people mm-hmm. we're we're in a world now that's kind of at the bottom of the of the barrel i don't know you know things could get worse under authoritarian government and so forth but how do you how do you address when you're surrounded by grimness what is, how do you find inspiration? How do, how do you start making headway? I think for me, it's um, going back to going back to the well of experiences that have in the past lifted you out of um, places of darkness. Um, going back to battles won, uh, understanding that though you may not have been in this particular battle, you have been in other battles and have been victorious. I think about just the incredible struggles with my, um, with my immigration status for, for many, many, many years. Um, the work I did with undocumented immigrant youth here in the US, where for the first time in the history of the country, there was a shifting of the narrative of who an undocumented immigrant is and what our potential as people really is, what our value to this nation is. Uh, A retelling of the stories of our lives and our struggles and our victories, not by innuendos or statistics or by policy experts, but by us by using our own voice, uh, sharing these stories in our own words and being more connected than ever to the average American in making that human to human connection. I go back to those moments where, you know, whether it's sitting uh, in the chambers of the US Congress and watching a vote that I'd fought years for go down in flames or, whether it's sitting there and winning the next uh, battle. Um, It's, you you have to go back to your experiences. You know, you have to go back to the people that have always been around you and supported you, to your networks, right? Uh, And for me, that is my family. Um, It's my friends um, and it's my faith. It's those, those are the things that really keep me grounded and keep me going. Well, and as a, a new American, I remember you once shared a story with me about the role of the theater performance and music of Hamilton in uh, helping you dig out of a ditch. Yes. I am a huge Hamilton fan. <laughs> <laughs> a huge Hamilton fan. Um, I, you know, it's, funny because I didn't see Hamilton until last year, um, until 2019. Um, But I saw it in the best possible of settings. I saw it in Puerto Rico with Lin-Manuel, and it was absolutely incredible. Uh, I got the Hamilton soundtrack 
long before I ever saw a single person on on stage performing. Um, and I remember when I got the soundtrack, um, it was actually while I was working in an Africa development um, institution and one of our board members had heard me talking about Hamilton. He's like, okay, I can't get you a ticket to the play, but here's the soundtrack. Um, and so I'd have it in my car living in DC, uh, drove around everywhere. Um, so I'd have it in my car and I'd have it playing. And I remember listening to the entire track from beginning to end and bawling my eyes out at the end of it. This is without seeing a single person, um, a single person, a single actor, uh, but the music, the words, the lyrics, all, all of it uh, made an incredible impression on me. And in 2017, a lot of people, um, and in my experience, I would say particularly people that were in my world and dealt with um, U.S. immigration policy or were immigrants themselves, there was a very dark period. Um, you know, in the spring of 2017, we'd had the Muslim ban. We'd had so much uncertainty in our society. Uh, we were fighting for to, to keep the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which is a program instituted by the previous administration uh, that aided in temporary status for 800,000 undocumented immigrant youth that were now working and thriving in the U.S. Those battles were raging, and I personally uh, was dealing with whether or not I'd be able to even remain in the U.S., which has been my home since I was in high school. I went to college here, you know, joined a sorority here. This is this is life. This is where my family was um, or is. Uh, and I was facing this untenable situation of possibly not being able to re remain in my home. Um, I'd lost out on an incredible job that I was certain would change everything and life would finally begin. Um, and I, I, I went into quite the dark place. Um, I retreated from all of the structures that had helped me stay sane um, in, in the past and just went inwards and myself, um, had excessive insomnia for, for a bit and really struggled to dig myself out of it. And I remember one morning waking up and talking to a dear, dear friend of mine who inspires me beyond words. Um, and she had just one simple advice for me. She's like, go to what's happy. You know, try to remember the last time you were happy and go there. And the last time I remember being happy was in my car, <laughs> driving and listening to Hamilton. And so I put on my headphones and blasted the soundtrack and just danced and laughed and went back to a time when I felt freer. I felt inspired by the story of a young man who, by all estimations, should not have become who he became, could, should not have been able to create the legacy that he ultimately left the world with. He is a person that made the impossible seem inevitable. Um, and I relate, I relate so much to that. Um, and I found hope and strength in that. Um, and that really, for me, was, um, was an important important experience to have and hold close to my heart because now I can go back to it. And even in the middle of this, I go back to that time and I can think at my lowest moment, I got my lowest moments. I was able to dig myself back out with family, with faith, with Hamilton, <laughs> and just understanding that life goes on in one form or another, life goes on. Um, and your worst day does not have to be the legacy you leave for the rest of your life. Um, you have an opportunity each day to build something different. Well, that that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. That's really, uh, how would I say, and, and the way I see it, the courage that you exhibit in sharing when you're down is part of why you take people up. And I, I really, really enjoyed that little passage. Thank you. Uh, we've talked in the past as, in difficult circumstances. You've worked a lot in climate and questions of, of migration. 
working with the UN on uh, a big project there just in the last year or so. Young people, Greta Thunberg, fresh eyes. My late friend who died on Christmas Day, William Grider, who was one of the most brilliant journalists and commentators on American political economy that I've ever encountered, he set up his website, and uh, he was in his 80s at the time, I believe, or late 70s or early 80s, and he, one of his, I think his first post was about why he had so much trust in young people. And in essence, it was because they look at what's needed and they're not conditioned by what's feasible. And there are certain times when our institutions, whether government, private sector, uh, intellectual ideologies have gone stale, have revealed fault lines and need transition. Do you sense that the, the energy and the conviction of young people will be invigorated by this crisis as, as almost an unmasking so we can turn the corner? Absolutely. I, I don't doubt it for a second. Uh, I think for us, you know, we've lived in rapidly changing times. We've been through this before. Um, I was reading a piece not too long ago that talked about how, you know, my generation has experienced two recessions <laughs> successively. Um, it, it feels it feels like um, and so so close together, um, and that's not normal. Um, there was the the advent of rise of of the internet and 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 new technologies that we never could have imagined um, and we continue to just roll with it and found opportunity and beauty and um a way to not just enjoy life more uh but also to create space for others uh to to build a more fulfilling life so i i don't doubt that um at, at top of mind for me in, in, in this is that we cannot um, allow this crisis to go to waste. One of the people I enjoy learning from is Jean Case. I love her push to make failure matter. Our failures when it comes to this global pandemic can be the basis for transformational change in addressing the impact of climate change or building empathy that leads to action on the migrant and refugee crisis that is still raging. Uh, for the first time in our history, each of us, every single one of us on this planet can relate to every other person in some way. We are all going through the same storm. And although we're not in the same boat, some are riding out the storming yachts while others are barely keeping their head above water and rafts, but still, still, there is a connectedness um, and that empathy can drive uh, empathy can can drive a solution it can drive us in this situation to search for better um, it is now easier to draw a, a near direct line between citizens in the west uh, and their race to protect their families uh, from the same potential threat as that of migrants and refugees who long before this crisis struggled with educating their kids, uh, preserving their livelihood, uh, having access to medical care and other resources. So I, you know, in the midst of massive amount of tragedy and suffering, I, I think we have to honor all of that uh, by learning from it, growing from it, and making necessary adjustments to ensure that we never go through the same crisis the same way again. Um, but more than that, we can even take the opportunity to fix those parts of the, our world uh, that have always been broken, but are made e ever more plain, um, if I could say it that way, by, by this crisis. And who was the author that you cited? That Jean, uh, Jean Case. Jean Case, because yeah. I've read uh, similar works of similar spirit, A Paradise Built in Hell, by uh, Rebecca Solnit, uh, The Extraordinary Communities That Arise in Disaster was the subtitle, or the Buddhist Pema Children's book, When Things Fall Apart. 
and that's more about the inward disciplines that one adopts in order to uh, become constructive and a contributor. One of the things that I find fascinating, and this really relates to the uh, Institute for New Economic Thinking, is that I heard you say earlier in this conversation that dwelling on the, hum the human, focusing on the human, a lot of our mechanical abstract economics is, is what you might call icy, it's cold, it's distant from humans, as though what you might call a dispassionate view from afar may, how you say, not make you victim of the siren songs of temptation. But I think economics has, has uh, the, you know, how would I say, perhaps gone too far in the pendulum of trying to avoid the notion of humanity and feelings and emotion. And psychologists and literary and artistic figures can, how would I say, help us come back to the table. But in my conversations with you in recent days, I, saw, I heard another thing you repeatedly uttered, which is instead of seeing the global south or this place in Africa or that place in India as another nation, people are recognizing that we're all in this boat together. I'm reminded, uh, not a particularly uh, happy statement, but Martin Luther King once said, uh, in reference to the United States, we all came in on different ships, but now we're all in the same boat, or we're all in the same boat now. And uh, I, I, is there potential, is there energy in, you know, when we talk about antiseptic notions of global governance, but is there now a positive energy associated with people connecting with the suffering and humanity wherever on earth? And is there a possibility for analogs to things like a Marshall Plan or a structure where resources are transferred to support those poorer economies in the global south, those poor societies, excuse me, in the global south, uh, who, who need resources and who are in tremendous danger of a prolonged and deep crisis. Absolutely. I, there, I'm a scientist like you, like we believe in facts and numbers, etc. cetera. Um, and as much as, uh, as much as I am a scientist and I am about statistics and, and what makes sense, I also understand that people are people are people and other numbers and statistics have their place and they are extremely important but you have to first connect with people as human beings. You have to find that commonality. You have to find a way to relate and then start a conversation. Because not only does it give you access to that person on a very basic, very human level um, and to their heart as opposed to just their brain, uh, it also allows you to make a link and to make a better argument that suits the individual or the community that you are communicating with rather than one that is purely based in innuendos or statistics that may not completely translate to the person you're talking to. Breaking down barriers, exposure as a tool of so social change is incredibly important. Exposure to those and inclusion of the other breaking down of assumptions that dehumanize um, and, and creates an impulse to recoil in fear or maybe strike out. When you connect with the person, all of that changes. And I see opportunity in this moment to say, I may not understand what was happening in your country that got you on a life raft through the Mediterranean to try to get yourself to Europe. But I do understand after losing my job and my daughter was unable to go to school 
um, and my town was shut down, I understand the fear and the frustration of not knowing where to turn to for help. Building that bridge means that we can start from a place of trust, a place of understanding, a place that recognizes and respects our common humanity. Uh, I think that change, particularly change that politicians may not see in their direct interest, has to come from the people. Um, I am a firm believer that all politics is local. You really do have to connect with the individual. So start with the individual, then the community, and then go up from there. And that is a way to build lasting change. We saw that here with the Affordable Care Act, uh, where policy came before really a mass movement and mass understanding of the need for this in a person-to-person -person level. And then we spent years defending it. But the second that people related to it more, the second they experienced it more and understood, like, this is my life. Like, it was your life, and I did not get it. And yes, we should do better at making sure that you don't have to personally experience pain for you to care for another person's pain. We should absolutely do better with that. Um, but in this moment, what we do have is an opportunity to, to make a simple connection and say, we can relate on a human level. Let's use that as a foundation to build better. Uh, because this crisis is really just revealing very plainly areas that have been broken, healthcare systems that have been overtasked, communities that have not had the resources that they've always needed, black and brown businesses that are, haven't gotten the support uh, that is needed or the economic relief that is needed, whereas others do. All of these things have always been there. They have been made worse by this, um, but I am hopeful um, that we can take advantage of the opportunity to recognize it and make it better and not just honor the struggle, right? I think that's one thing we tend to do is we magnify and honor the struggle and put our essential workers on a pedestal, but we don't give them the basic things that they need, a living wage, um, hazard pay, recognition of the work accompanied with appropriate measures to make sure they can continue to do that work and protect themselves and their families. All of these things are opportunities for us to be and do better. You, uh, in your, what you might call organizational or managerial dimension of your talent, have worked very hard at what you might call uh, the weaving together of government, philanthropic organizations, and the private sector. And as you envision the challenge here, are you seeing a positive response from each of those three areas that you would, that, how would I say, you'd like to illuminate? Is that is part of what you might call the rungs in the ladder of a return to hopefulness evident to you in each of those sectors of society? There, there are people that are doing very well, and then there are others that need a little bit more coast, coasting along. Um, <laughs> so... There, you know, you look, example of governments doing incredible, incredibly well, you look at New Zealand and Jacinda Ardern and what she's doing and how she's leading her country, doing incredibly well, leading with empathy, um, backed by science uh, and, and, and governing in a way that is building trust. Um, you know, that is an example of governments doing, uh, doing exactly what's needed to protect their their society to protect their citizens. Um, you look at businesses that are also making a pivot to not retreat uh, from investing in uh, in their social impact initiatives, but doubling down and and doing more. Um, you know, the the financial crisis is certain to curb investments in social change, um, at least on the short term, layoffs, uh, demands, um, demand is depressed, production is stalled. Um, but there's also an opportunity for, for companies to make 
their pivots, right, to protect themselves, uh, their, their and by themselves I mean their employees and their con- and, and their consumers, um, and also protect the planet. So there is uh, there is an opportunity to to be flexible, to pivot, um, to do what is necessary on. Uh, on, on the philanthropy side, uh, there, there is such a tremendous need right now, uh, and there are less resources available. So I do have a fear of an overburdening of, of that system, and we've seen it with food banks here in, in, in the U.S. and the resources that they're able to, to provide. Uh, however... There is opportunity for each of us to find ways to contribute in, in greater ways to, to these organizations. It could be financially, it could be with time, um, of course, doing it with and through the lens of social distancing, whatever it is that we can do, however we can push forward through this. There, Yes, absolutely, there's opportunity. Um, it's not exactly done yet. <laughs> I don't know if this is the absolute darkest before the dawn, um, but we're definitely somewhere around, I don't know, maybe 3 a.m. So uh, we still we still have a little while to go, but there there is light at the end of this tunnel. And uh, how would I say, uh, do you think when you look at Asia, do you see a new form of leadership, a new form related to governance emerging? People in America are always in dread that they're losing their, what you might call, leadership role to the Chinese. On the other hand, uh, when, you're, when your model of organization is found wanting, if you're fearful, you can double down on your mistakes. And if you're inspired you can evolve are you seeing as you look at the united states and as you look at china uh, uh how i say the sands beginning to shift in a constructive direction or a destructive direction in, in either of those places i think when we look at what divides uh countries that have done well in in this crisis versus those that haven't, it really centers around governments that have depended on on experts and acted swiftly, um, particularly in the East Asian countries. So South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong uh, have done incredibly well in in this. Um, And there is, at minimum, with scientists, uh, clear global cooperation uh, when it comes to when it comes to addressing this, there are lessons learned that are being shared. Um, those lessons learned in some cases are translating to effective policies being put in place. Um, and that that is a good thing, right? There is, there is no one at the top or at the bottom. There is who is doing this effectively and where can we learn? Uh, the usual structures, not just in business, but in governments aren't necessarily working as effectively as they have in, in the past. Some would argue they've never worked as effectively as, as, as those leading the countries would say they have. Uh, but relying on just solutions uh, that have proven effective um, and looking at governments that have been able to do well, there are lessons that the United States is learning from these East Asian countries um, that is translate, translating to be extremely positive in, in how we address this crisis. The, uh, as I listen to you, I, I remember a book I read years ago and it's called uh, the, the Thought of the Heart and the Soul of the World. It's by a Jungian psychologist named James Hillman, uh, who's written many great books. But it, it's, I've, I sense that you, uh, which I call, you see, and I don't mean this in a literal optic sense, you see the potential for the return of the soul uh, to the world in this, this turmoil, this, this shaking off of habits, uh, as the Chinese, you know, crisis is opportunity. I said earlier, uh, what, 
do you have a do you have a vision of how you're going to narrow your focus and do you have a zoom lens of where tolu's going to make a difference in this next phase Oh, everywhere I possibly can. Uh, <laughs> 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 opportunities are popping up every day. Um, for me, my priority has always been people. Um, I have a heart for people, and I, you know, it, 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 I'll, I'll be perfectly honest with you. It wasn't always that way. Um, I grew up wanting to simply be an engineer. That was my dream since I was eight years old. Um, breaking the VCR, trying to figure out how how the how it worked, where the credits at the end of movies went. Um, that was my focus. That was all I wanted to do. Um, and then life threw me a significant curveball when I could not work in my own field and I had to look beyond myself. Um, and I really gained something incredibly valuable by learning to understand people in the world, to be gentler and more generous, to see the gray um, and understand that people do not live in the black and white. They often do live in the gray um, and leading with empathy is important. Uh, I, I it, it's, it's amazing what going through through a, a struggle you never thought coming does to to change to change your view of the world to change how you see your place in the world. Um, I worked for free for many many years, uh, helping to advance the cause of young people that were struggling to make a life in the only home they'd ever known. And for me. That is what I want to continue to do. Um, my work in U.S. immigration policy, global migration, my work at the United Nations on uh, climate change continues to center around people. Um, there is an incredibly, an incredibly valuable opportunity right now for, for business to take a lead uh, in filling the gap between what they what what we have and what we lack. Uh, we've never needed social governance to be a more democratized uh, entity than 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 we do now. Um, there's an opportunity for their for, for for businesses to do well um, while making it a priority to build a more sustainable world so while making their consumers a priority, while making their employees a priority. There is an opportunity for business to take a lead in shaping this next phase of, um, of our civilization in a sense, right? Um, and center it around people, center it around progressive policies uh, that is kind to to our planet and to the people uh, that whether work with them or uh, are, are consumers of, of their products. As, as the world eagerly pursues a return to normal life, um, we absolutely should tr strive for a new normal that embraces a more balanced relationship with our planet and e with each other. My goal is to continue to help find the gaps, the spaces where we can build that more balanced relationship between the work that businesses are doing, governments are doing, um, and civil society is is building towards. And I, I guess where I, there's another dilemma, and I I know you've lived right in the center of it, which is, does the pandemic, the disorientation it creates. And the fatigue impede the momentum towards addressing the climate challenge. We've exhausted fis fiscal resources, etc. Quote, we can't afford it uh, because of this to transform our energy systems rapidly. Or do you see that the, which am I called the ideology that was reluctant to embrace in collective action 
uh, is now shattered by the necessary response to the pandemic and uh, that we cannot we can essentially learn from this and move forward and accelerate the collective priority of climate change do, do you do you have a sense in that pendulum is it going to slow down is it going to accelerate or or what well the coronavirus uh pandemic quite similarly to climate change is partly a problem of our economic our societal uh structures um you know while on the surface, they are kind of environmental uh, problems. Uh, one can argue that they are socially driven um, and it is centered around our need to manage consumption. Uh, and addressing both absolutely requires a rethinking of what we need, making uh, adjustments to what we deem as necessary um, and, and our priorities, our economic priorities, or, or, or social priorities. Um, and normal interventions for both uh, can't work. Uh, and there is, an, an, you know, oftentimes there is this kind of, all right, let's produce our way out of this problem. Let's spend our way out of this problem. Uh, but what we need with the, corona, the coronavirus pandemic is, is to scale back, right? Essential workers, um, are 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 out there um, doing everything to to keep us safe, and the rest of us are asked to to stay home um, and focus on what we absolutely need in in terms of goods and and services. There has been a climate effect to all of this, where we've seen a the clearing of of uh, of air <laughs> in in so many spaces in LA that the the fog and the smog is lifted. Um, you know the same in in India. Um, you know pollution rates have dropped in so many areas around around the world. Um, but we have to. It would be easy to say, "Oh, this is fantastic for the climate," even as the 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 sea turtles are are playing and and uh, and and the waters have never been clearer, even in 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 Venice. It would be easy to say, let's keep this going, um, but it's, but that's not the that's not the perfect solution, right? The perfect solution isn't shutting down everything. The perfect solution is finding a balance um, and a way to scale back production uh, and the hustle and bustle of life. That does not mean the loss or the collapse of economies and, and our livelihood. There is no reason for us to now think that addressing the climate crisis is impossible. It is clearly possible. Um, and the climate crisis is as much a crisis um, and will be as much a crisis for you know, a generation to come as is this pandemic. Uh, climate change is disproportionately affecting folks in the global south. It is disproportionately affecting those um, that are already facing significant inequities. Um, as with the coronavirus, it, it, it will, it has and will continue to expose the broken areas of our economic structures. Um, and there is an opportunity for us having pulled back now uh, not to say, well, let's just go 200 times ahead to replace all that was lost. Uh, I think there has to be a rethinking of, again, what is necessary and how do we build uh, a new world, right? As, as we just kind of push to what's normal, how, how do we find this balance of, of a new normal that allows us to prioritize? effectively. Uh, there is, I, I, I worked on a World Economic Forum project um, and, and launched a World Economic Forum project a few years ago that fo focused on remote working as an alternative to physical migration. And I remember, you know, 
all the problems you faced when it came to taxation um, and and you know, not physical migration, but legally, how do you employ folks across borders? What are the infrastructures that uh, that need to be in place for people to work remotely? So much of that has gotten thrown out the window now where it's like, yeah, we'll figure it out. <laughs> Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll make it work. Yes, there's still gaps in infrastructure, but there's an opportunity for us to build up resiliency in, in, in those areas. These things are possible. Um, we understand now that the multiple trips every day to the same location or grocery store or a, a mall or whatever is not necessary. You can actually do that in a more effective way. There is there are opportunities to look at new technologies um, that allow the things that you need to be brought directly into into your homes, um, and there is not necessarily the need for you to uh, to constantly be out in the world. Um, I also recognize that staying home for many people is an absolute luxury. Um, and there's so much more that we need to do to make sure that each and every person has everything that they need to be able to live free of fear uh, and, and lack. But when it comes to climate, this is giving us a preview into what, I pray not, um, but what could be our future um, in the negative aspects. Um, in the positive aspects as, as well, when you look at the decrease in, in the decrease in pollution, et cetera, but in the negative aspects in terms of inequalities being um, ma magnified, uh, we, we have to deal with this before it forces us to shut down the way we've had to right now. We have to, if we don't deal with climate change incrementally and we let it get out of control as we have been, um, then we will face the same crises again. And as someone who's already been through our fair share of crises, whether it's a recession or this, and who knows what else is to come, I'd rather not go through another. So if for nothing else from me, can we try to find a solution? That would be ideal. <laughs> you would, uh, just for the benefit of our listeners, you had mentioned to me that you were very inspired by the writings of Simon Sinek and uh, his newest book called The Infinite Game. I remember you said something, the phrase you used was, it embraces an existential flexibility. Can you, can you explain to me why his writing inspires you at this moment and, and what is contained in that notion of existential flexibility? Absolutely. Um, I absolutely uh, just adore and respect Simon Sinek. Uh, you know, this is the idea that businesses should hone making a 180 degree turn to take advantage of new technology or deal with a completely changed environment. Um, you know, this crisis we're in feels unprecedented, but for the corporate world, it's not necessarily, right? Changing technology or cultural conditions is not something new. It's been uh, challenges that businesses have faced in the past and has challenged the current business model. So Simon uses the example of the rise of the internet. So businesses were agile um, and those that survived were able to pivot and incorporate those. Those that weren't were not able to. For example, you look at Blockbuster, um, you know, now we have Netflix and Blockbuster were alive uh, at, at the same time. One continues, one is not around anymore. Um, there has to be, businesses have to be agile enough to pivot. Um, when it comes to climate change, there's always been that concern about us being able to do that, but you know, it's clearly possible. Uh, what needs work is, is scaling back in the areas uh, that we must you know, dial back for for the effects of runaway climate change uh, to not overwhelm our, our economies or, or collapse our, our economies in, in many situations. But I, I absolutely love the idea of being flexible enough um, to be able to shift um, as as conditions change. 
Well, I remember Cynic once said something to the effect that uh, when people are, are trying to deal in this chaotic circumstance, they're not <laughs> competing for a year-end bonus. He said something to the effect that we do, we do these things because we think we're contributing to something that's bigger than ourselves, something that will have value that will last long beyond our lifetimes. Well, I want to say to you in listening you today to you and envisioning what kind of leaders we should have in this country and on this planet, I was inspired by a song that came into my mind by the rock and roll band U2. And it's a it's written, it's called 40, and it's written like four zero, the number. That it's written where the the singer, Bono, is appealing to God to turn the corner. And then at the beginning of the second verse, in talking, uh, and this is an analogy to Psalm number 40 in the Bible, he says, He set my feet upon a rock and made my footsteps firm. Many will see and many will see and hear. I will sing, sing a new song. I will sing, I will sing a new song. The world needs a new song. And in these last 58 minutes, you've been one heck of a singer. I really enjoyed your observations and the inspiration that you provide. And I'm looking forward to watching your journey continue to unfold. And I hope you'll come back and join me at various steps along the way. Thanks for being here today. Thank you so much. This has been absolutely incredible. Um, I, I'm truly honored for the opportunity. And thank you for sharing that, um, that, that song with me. That is incredibly inspirational. Um, I think for me, there is just this need to continue to yield to the call of better, right? Um, and I am finding that in so many areas of life, so many people um, all around me are yielding to the call of better. Young people who are uh, on in, in their senior year and unable to go to prom, or you know, families that uh, are are in situations that are completely untenable are finding ways to yield to better. Um, and I am I am grateful for that. Um, I am grateful to be surrounded by people like you that are really um, helping to to make this world just brighter. We will talk again soon. Thanks. Thank you. And bye bye. Bye bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.